Hey guys, it's Daniel. The following is a quote from Kurt Cobain where he talks about how, from a production standpoint, he was trying to capture a sound like the Pixies for In Utero. Kurt, in particular, was a fan of the Pixies record Surfer Rosa, which Steve Albini produced. Steve Albini, of course, being the producer on In Utero. I did an interview with Steve Albini where he touched on the history of the making of that record. If you want to see that interview, it's linked below. In this quote, Kurt talks a lot about Steve's approach with microphones. This quote is from an interview Kurt Cobain did with Q Magazine in the UK from July of 1993. Quote, We got the sound that we wanted. Exactly the same sound that I have been carrying in my head since the beginning of this band. I always wanted to record a record which has a very personal ambiance to it. A record that sounds as though you were standing next to a band in a room, where you're hearing all the reflections off the walls. That's exactly how it transferred onto tape. The reason for that is that we use a lot of microphones. The theory that I came across one night when I was thinking about how to get a band across on record was I realized microphones are directional, and they only pick up the surface of whatever the microphone's pointed at and within a radius of a few inches. I thought if you pointed three or four microphones at the snare drum, you'd be able to get the real sound of the snare drum. It sounds ridiculous to 99% of producers because that's not the way they've been taught. It's not the standard way. But I've always liked to experiment, so I thought I would like to do something like that. Ever since we started recording, I've suggested it to producers and they weren't willing to do it. They just said it isn't the way to record. But listening to Surfer Rosa and Pod, the Pixies and Breeders album Steve Albini produced, I sensed that was what Steve was doing, though I didn't know. I never read any interview where he explained his recording process, but I just felt he might be doing it. And I'd heard he was very much into experimenting, so I thought if he didn't do it this way, then he might be willing to try it. But it turned out that's exactly what his trick is. We used maybe 30 microphones taped to the walls, the ceiling, the floor, all over the place. That's exactly how it was recorded. I had five or six microphones in front of my amplifier. A few up close, a few a couple of feet away, and that's how we recorded, that's how the vocals were recorded. With five microphones. I did vocals and guitar separately. We used a ridiculous number of microphones. They play a big part in his theory of recording. He uses a lot of old German microphones from the 1930s and other brand I can't name. But very specific ones. I never wanted to become this much of a tech head, because I always figured if you just played passionately, it would come out that way. But it's not like that. It's a very strict and meticulous job, something I've had a hard time with ever since I started recording. It's mathematics, and I've always been terrible at math. It's a very long, tedious process, which just goes on for hours and days and days. Mind-boggling. It's like trying to cram for an exam the night before. It's definitely not as easy as a lot of people think. Put up a few microphones and play. That's not it. I did all the vocal tracks in about six hours for the whole record. Kept knocking them off one after the other. It just happened to be a good day. Sometimes my voice will go out within a couple of hours. Sometimes my voice will go out within a couple of hours. That happened a lot on the Nevermind sessions. End quote. Now, as mentioned off the top, there was controversy in terms of the production of the record. When both the band and Nirvana's label heard the finished product, they both felt the mix wasn't where it should be, which resulted in R.E.M. producer Scott Litt being hired to touch things up. One of the things that were touched up were Kurt's vocals. The following is another quote from Kurt from July of 93, where he touches on this. Quote, We decided to take a chance on remixing two of our songs to make sure the vocals would be loud enough. Heart Shaped Box and Scentless Apprentice. The rest of them we thought we'd take the chance of improving them during the mastering. Mastering is an amazing thing. You can really change a lot of things. You can take the vocals completely out or turn them up 4 or 5 decibels. That took care of it. We'd realized the bass wasn't audible enough and the vocals were too quiet and that's about it. But that's all we changed and now we're 100% satisfied. I wouldn't change anything now. Though, there was that initial three weeks when it's true that we didn't know what we were going to do. For about three weeks, we were baffled. We didn't know what was wrong. So I wasn't looking forward to hearing it when usually I'll listen to what we've just recorded a lot to scrutinize it. I just could not put my finger on it at all. I couldn't tell what was wrong. Then, after about three weeks, we all realized the vocals weren't loud enough. We just hadn't spent enough time on the mixes. 